Sante? Yes. Yes, no. Awesome. Thank awesome. You. So yeah, good afternoon. And thank you, Simone, for the invitation yeah. and also to Professor Narduzzo for the opportunity. And, and as we, you know, as Simone mentioned, um, we were meant to be in Bolzano today, but unfortunately there's a pandemic going on. And, um, but fortunately also there's no physical or digital barrier in order to knowledge share. So um, here we are, fortunately, we have the tools to do it nowadays. Just a brief introduction to add some of what uh, Simone already said. I'm a senior service designer and innovation expert in Intesa San Paolo nowadays. I graduated in uh, service design in Politecnico di Milano and then in business design in Sole Sol 24 Ore Business School. And I had the opportunity to do some project with some Italian and also helping the development on, of um, some startups um, later years. Today, as you know, uh, I would like to talk to you about the connection and the uh, deep relationship between design and business. And I like to talk about you uh, about this, especially in 2020. And for me, it is also important because exactly 10 years ago, I was just entering in the field. Uh, before starting the, the presentation, I would just like to share with you uh, terms of condition, if we can call like that. Um, I would like to give you a, a high speed presentation. Uh, and by my side, I would like to avoid any kind of boredom. And please feel free to feed the chat feature in Microsoft Teams in order to type your questions during the speech so we can have the possibility to answer that at the end. OK, so let's begin. Um, I would like to take you to a journey, very informal journey. Uh, you know, it's Wednesday afternoon, so just relax. And I will try my best to get you excited as I am in this topic. I would like to start from an evolution, and it's the design evolution. We are taking apart all the craftsmanship uh, of the 19th century, and we're moving exactly uh, the last, last century in 1950, when uh, product uh, design and the design of products were um, at scale in organizations, uh, you know, all the in, in Italy, we also have the privilege to, to live in a country where this uh, began and we have uh, like masterpieces around product design. Uh, you know, we, we have the Olivetti typewriter, uh, also the automotive industry was very huge in that period. Then we move a little bit forward in the 70s when advertising and communication started to gain uh, importance in delivering messages to the people, to the customers. And then we see product designers, but also graphic designers, communication designers uh, uh, work, uh, working on uh, trying to design the perfect way in which a message is delivered to the public. Then we move a little bit further uh, in the, at the end of the century, when the um, concept and the idea of designing services uh, began to take a shape, and that when um, you know um, healthcare, um, the digital services began to to have the scene, and so we see also service designers designing not tangible elements, not communication, but services. And then we are in the new millennium and see um, the field of strategic design. So um, organizations um, started to understand that um, designers' capabilities could be useful not to design something, but in the way the organization works and deliver product, services, or communication into the market. But this scheme you can find it everywhere. Um, I would like to show you this in the opposite way because it's just not an evolution. It's an addition. Um, it's just new ways in which the same discipline of design 
um, as taking place in different areas. Another thing we um, hear also today very often is this sentence. You know, we see in news or on the internet or in the newspapers, a uh, well-dressed manager um, saying, my company is deeply customer centric. Um, I would like to take you on the backstage on, of that um, interview or on that uh, newspaper or in that video and show you how it works. So in the backstage, you know, in the, in the, in the stage, we have the manager and say, we have a very deep connection with our customer. But then there's also, you know, the marketing manager who says, yes, okay, I know the customer because I know the data about them. And also there's a budget manager who says, yes, okay, but we need to understand our customer about within the budget, right? And we have sale. Uh, who understands better the customer than the sale manager who deal directly with the customer? And he is the real customer-centric man inside the organization. Well, actually, there's also technology who um, understand everything, but you know, things have to be feasible uh, with the technology available today. And not only, there's his manager, who is uh, talking, yes, okay, the customer center, but we have KPIs and, uh, you know, this is how it works. We also have compliance managers who says, yeah, we have policies and we have to do the right and the better customer experience uh, or the better product we can inside the policies. And they're also the CEO, you know, okay, we are deeply customer centric, but we have, you know, um, two years of, um, revenues to get. Oh, not to forget, there's logistic between sale manager and customers and the logistic man who is delivering you the product doesn't care anything about your complaints about the damaging of the packaging you're receiving. And that's when, you know, the customer leaves because this connection is not that tight as the manager said to the interviewer. Well, this mention and picturing this scenario where the designer um, entered this game. Well, actually, my daily job and the daily job of so many designers within organization, big or small, or also in consulting firms on design agencies, dealing with service design and strategic design, is actually to put around the table all these stakeholders and try to think clearly and truly about the customer needs. Bringing sometimes and often the customer within the organization in order to um, speak with him, talk with him, understand his frustrations, he, his desires in order to really deliver an actual compliant technological uh, right for the marketing and selling product. But uh, we can say, you know, uh, there's a question and why we have to see Designers in this situation, you know, designers are artists, right? They just uh, care about aesthetic and how the beautiful things are going to be. Well, well, actually, I don't agree with this, all these sentences. And I will try to recall what has been defined as the three main capabilities of designers. Now, designers are very interesting also from a business perspective because one of the three capability is see. And it's just not just seeing, it's observing, understanding, and they are trained to do that. Uh, uh, they interview people, they follow, follow people inside stores or wherever service you are delivering in your industry. And they try to understand frustrations, uh, desires, and they talk with people, interact with them in order to understand not what it's good for them, but what is the most valuable thing or product can deliver to them? The second capability is to foresee and is uh, the magic one because it's imagination. You know? It's um, designers are trained to imagine a world that we are not living yet. And um, it's just, you know, there's a research um, conducted in the US, I think, that uh, um, said and placed cameras around different design studios and show that the design studio who delivered most innovative products and more, most innovative uh, services are the one who act as they were living in that future. 
and it's, it's called body thinking. You know, if you see a designer um, doing like this, they are maybe mimicking uh, DIY um, COVID-19 tampon. So this is very curious and interesting, and designers are trained to do that. The third one is to let see. With the power of imagination, designers can show to people what they are thinking or what other people is thinking. And that can be done by digital tools, you know, uh, but also schemes, rough schemes, and also quick sketching. You know? Designers are not, are not artists, but they can quickly picture an idea and let everyone on the same page on that idea, maybe arguing about that, but on the same page. It is very interesting. So this is just the three capabilities that strategic design has um, framed in order to explain what designer can do for the organizations. And it's very interesting, and I want you to um, make mix and match about the top 10 skills that the World Economic Forum um, enlisted last year. And I find some overlap, like problem problem solving, um, critical thinking, creativity, emotional intelligence, service orientation. It's quite interesting. And also, if we think that we are living um, in a world uh, where the market is hyper segmented, there are also um, all these different niche in every. In we see a polarization of the market. You know, mid price range is disappearing well, because of globalization, because of digitalization. But we see very low end prices and premium ones. And also, we know that the, mar the market is merciless and high speed in continuous evolution. In the last 20 years, has been the, all the evolution made maybe in a century. And last but not least, in 2020, uh, there's going to be a pandemic. And, you know, um, there's going to be, I was reading this morning, a um, recent study uh, from Gartner that said that, um, Unfortunately, or for someone, fortunately, um, COVID-19 um, made the organizational evolution and transformation on top of most CEO priorities, even the skeptical ones, not the digital transformation, organizational transformation. And this is interesting. And I'm going to insist on the same relationship, design and business. I want you to look with you a little bit back, you know, turning backwards in the last 10 years about this connect. Start in 2010. In 2010, the best innovation books at Business Week uh, and Listers, uh, we, find, we found three design, very design related books. And we know also that Business Week has a very huge business audience. Then move to 2012. This is Indra Noy, CEO at PepsiCo at that time. And that year, she hired uh, a man. Just remember that PepsiCo is a very large corporation, 63 billion in revenues, more than 2,000 employees, um, 6 billion in profits. So um, a very big game. And in that year, she hired this guy. And this guy was the first chief designer officer in a large group and at that scale um, and was a, a very huge leap for the design business and also for the, the business environment. 2014, EBM decided to invest a lot in expanding the design business within and they hired 1,300 designers in-house and that was one of the um, key aspects of this investment was trying to shift the ratio of uh, one designer every 62 employees to one to eight. And we see that a lot of design-driven companies, the successful one, take this ratio very narrow. So next year, 2015, this, uh, you know, this is the Fortune 100. You, must, uh, you maybe know it. In this list of the most valuable companies, in that year, more than 10% placed design as an executive priority. 
Uh, we just don't see companies well established in the design centers like Apple or uh, Walt Disney or Microsoft. We also see companies from a variety of industries like Ford Motors, General Electric, the, the PepsiCo one, uh, 3M, Johnson & Johnson. So we see that design can be useful uh, in, in so many different fields. The same year, still the business magazines trying to uh, communicate how design is important within the business uh, environment. Maybe if there's some designer in this course, uh, maybe know the um, Harvard Business Review number in September 2015, uh, it was a masterpiece and uh, a huge success for us as, uh, as professionals. But then move a little bit about what other businesses are dealing with designs and why are they moving? Well, we see that in um, 15 years, there's going to be, there has been uh, so many design acquisitions. And we see companies like Facebook and Google at the left part of the slide. And uh, we also see a couple of banks like Capital One, BBVA, and we see EBM. But then the most interesting part is that we see also a lot of consulting firms. At the big one, we see McKinsey, we see Accenture, we see PwC, KPMG. And we know that these consulting firms um, offer the services to a lot of big and huge corporations. So we, I expect that today the 10% what we saw before is even higher. Another important document is this research made by Forrester and IBM, and they tried to make the balance sheet of the design practice, and they found it are very interesting. Uh, they saw an increase in profitability for a better portfolio management, trying to wipe out all the unvaluable products for the customer and trying to invest more in the good ones, analyzing the customer needs not just the numbers, a reduction of the risks and improve in efficiency and transformation. And, and the design practice helped a lot, all the ABM um, clients to reduce this, the decision-making within the organization. Lately, another masterpiece uh, in the communication, in the business communication was the um, McKinsey quarterly report and uh, that uh, highlighted the business value of design and proves that design-driven companies outperform um, with a large number the most of the standards and poorest 500 list. And it's very latest news, 10, 10 days ago, uh, General Motors announced that they're going to hire a lot of designers in order to focus more on innovation and, of course, the future of mobility, but especially to trying to fuel the company and all their employees with experimental mindset. In these 10 years, I want to, to, I want to um, give you also a bonus topic that is venture capital. Uh, I don't have so many data about that, but it's interesting, interesting to talk about a little bit about that. We see that in seven years, venture capital firms um, are investing in designers and trying to hire designers within their firms. And those designers are not uh, designing products or services. They are helping venture capital and their clients, so new businesses, startups, in order to get the mindset of experimenting and get the mindset within the organization from the beginning in order to um, bring the customer within and make valuable services and products that then may make successful those venture capital firms, of course. There's also another uh, um, move very interesting, that is these capital firms are um, not only hiring designers, but are also um, putting design uh, mentorship within their portfolio, not only investing in early stage design agencies, but also, you know, when there's a very high VC market, like in Silicon Valley, um, you lose or acquire a new startup, 
also because of your services. And having design mentorship is going to be a competitive advantage for them. OK, well, that was just a slide to remind me to, to drink my glass. OK, here we are. OK, so we were talking a lot about design and business, right? And this relationship. And I want you to focus on um, why we are talking about that. I think, and what for what I started and what I experienced and what I am experiencing every day, is that design is the better way to de-risk the innovation spending and gaining the confidence of the team or the organization or uh, the institution and investing time, people, and budget in the right way. And this could be a very um, easy logical shift, but not that easy because we see uh, organizations are like a very huge amount of uh, people inside that and organize a structure in a very um, precise way. This shift is very easy to explain, at least. From a traditional process, when you ideate something, then you develop it and you launch. And then after launch, you learn about what you have put in the market. With design practices, we have a smarter one. We ideate, we prototype very cheaply something, bring it to the customer or a potential customer and learn about it how she or he interact with it, move with it, if it's going to be a space or a retail store, and then learn how to change our proposition. And then when we have the right confidence, we can develop and launch the service or the product into the market. And this is called user feedback. And the more you do, the less risk you're putting into the hands of your customer. I think you all know the cost of change curve when cost and timings are on the graph. And if we see, you know, the typical um, line when the cost um, rise up in the time of the project from requirements to production, I know also that agile methodology trying to um, successfully uh, lower a little bit this curve, but just, just like this, take this for, for example, is key to iterate at the very beginning of your process. That's why venture capital are investing in early stage startups. And that's why organizations are trying to get design practices inside in order to change things and the way the company deliver products from the beginning. And talking about design practices, I don't have to explain you also the, all the many processes we have uh, in the discipline. I know that uh, Professor Simonelli um, taught you uh, most of them. Uh, we see the Stanford uh, methodology. We see the Design Council diagram. IBM is trademark uh, has has trademarked uh, one of them. Uh, we see the newly market well marketed uh, uh, design sprint from Google Venture. So I would like to um, go to the final chapter of my speech trying to look at Italy, you know? Uh, we are in 2020, uh, and what about design? What about business and design and business in our home country? Well, we see a lot of big companies that are investing and doing well um, in design and taking design as a competitive advantage from different fields. And if we see as um, in Italy, uh, in his economic um, ecosystem, we see that we have a lot, a lot, like 99% of our enterprises and organization are small and medium enterprises. We have in the recent three years, a stable number of startups in Italy. And we deal with, I think, more than 10, um, I don't know the exact number of university program uh, on design in Italy. So we have fresh designers every year, but not to mention also, the all the design courses that are taking place within um, different university, and you are one of them. So we have all the ingredients, right? We just need to find the right way in order and find the receipt and the right, the right receipt in order to to mix them. 
I think it's just a cultural gap. And the cultural gap we need to bridge. Me as designers in the business and you as future innovators and future entrepreneurs in, in, in Italy or wherever you're going. To highlight this concept of cultural gap, I uh, would like to bring you an example. Is in 1995, and Design Continue came to Italy. Design Continuum is one of the biggest multinational in design in the world. It came to Italy and decided to remove the design from its branding. And its branding is the heart of the company, right? Because in Italy and in Italian, the design worlds resemble um, too much the word drawing. And design is not drawing. Another aspect on this cultural gap, I think it's um, what we mentioned at the beginning, right? We have a very strong and powerful heritage in product design. We see a lot of companies um, being successful for that. And we all see, all, also see a lot of product designers from all over the world coming to Ito to work for them. We, have, we had Olivetti, unfortunately, we still have Piaggio, uh, we have Carter, Floss, and all the furniture industry um, is, is what we have as an heritage, but it's also a cultural gap. Because in the scheme we see um, at the beginning, this is make us blind about all the potential design can have in different aspects. So we have the receipt. We just have to, you know, mix it well. Let me conclude my presentation with some takeaways. And in order to, uh, this is my sharing, you know. I would like to um, remind you that good design is good business and vice versa. Because design is strongly connected with business management, more than aesthetic. As innovators and interpreters of today, because you're graduating maybe next year, surround yourself with designers. Because it's our goal, as we mentioned before, to bridge the cultural gap in our country. And do not allow yourself to graduate without being aware of what design is for business. And as you and Simone mentioned at the beginning of the afternoon, uh, you the first lesson you you came with some definition of design by your side. I want you to give mine, and I I just stole it. Uh, from uh, a Stanford professor, professor I met years ago, and it says design is just um, a conversation. It's a conversation between time, space, and culture. And I would like to start with this conversation with you uh, this afternoon, but also uh, from today. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm clapping uh, virtually. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the QR code. Uh, oh, don't worry. I ask you once, 20 seconds, because I changed my net 